Um, earlier uh, in, the, in the year, last year, we decided that we were going to commit through going through the book of Genesis, and we've been calling this series Foundations. And it's been a wonderful study to look through the first section of Genesis. And today we're going to be coming up to chapters 10 and 11. And um, this will signify the end of the first section in Genesis. Genesis is set up in two parts. You've got four great moments or great movements. And then you've got four great people in the latter part. In the last seven or eight months, we have covered 2,000 years of history. So congratulations. You guys are that good. I mean, you now know 2,000 years of history within eight months. Uh, just kidding. As you know, we've been getting a bird's eye view of these things, and today is no different. We're going to be looking at really what I like to call a segue chapter between the first portion and the second portion. And today's passages, are, we're going to, as we get a bird's eye view, we're going to look at things that help us answer relevant questions that we have with our society today. Questions like, where do all the languages in the world come from? So no one ever thought of that. Why do we have so many different people groups that have different languages? Did you know we have about 6,500 active languages in the world today? Isn't that impressive? Where does that come from? How about all the different people groups? Are they, re are they the result of evolution uh, that... Uh, that uh, secular worldview suggest, or is there something more to it? Why are there so many different colored people in the world? How did people spread across the world? These are all these questions. How about this question? Is it good or bad to have a separate, independent political state when they're often in conflict? Everyone ever thought of that? Everyone thought, man, we should just have peace in the world. What would it be like to have a monolithic super state for the world? Will the world ever have one government? All of those questions flow out of these chapters, chapters 10 and 11. So if you're here today to get a fuzzy, superficial, feel-good sermon, I'm afraid that this is not going to be for you. We're going to have a feel-good sermon, but it's going to be based on the truth of God's word and this deep truth as we study where we come from within our history. Um, we're going to see the spiritual side of our everyday life and how God set it up, uh, which is very interesting. Now, there's a popular trend in America today where people more and more are trying to trace their ancestral roots, their heritage. More and more people want to know where they came from, what they're connected to in the past, and what kind of traits and why they have the traits that they have. Um, anybody ever try any of that? Have they gone on, checked out? different websites, gone to Ancestry, Ancestry.com or 23andMe, pretty cool stuff. Technology has given us these tools to help us trace our past. We now understand DNA so much more, where science can map out the genetic structure and tell us about our past and where we came from from the inside out. The cells in your body, each of you have 23 pairs of chromosomes. These chromosomes make up your DNA and this DNA is an absolute thumbprint of you. Uh, and people can look at this and they can tell you about yourself from the inside. We also have access to this World Wide Web that gives us information at the click of a button more than ever before where you can find out more about your relatives, about your history, about the past. It's all pretty amazing. Um, and maybe you've seen this in recently on a TV commercial, but Ancestry.com uh, took, uh, recently took a famous painting of the signing of the Declaration of Independence and reenacted it by finding uh, people today that are related to those people in the photo. So I'll show you the, the original painting of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. There it is. I want you to notice the color of skin that most every one of those people have in that video or in that painting, right? It's, it's all, they're all white people, all right? So if you go now to the reenactment of this recently, these are people that descended from the signers of the Declaration of Independence. Now look at the difference. It's all quite amazing, isn't it? Boy, it's almost as if we're not as different as we may have thought. There's some things in our past that we need to know about. And we're going to find out more about that in Genesis chapter 10. 
Um, Tommy Sword recently went onto one of these websites and researched his heritage and found out a little bit of where he came from. And so I, I asked for his permission to use this. And this is Tommy Sword's ethnicity, okay? And look at how many different people groups that Tommy represents in his life. You've got English, Irish, Scottish, Scandinavian, Italian. Even this was really great. He is 2% Nigerian. How cool is that? Tommy Sword. I want to say thank you, Tommy, for that. We'll uh, tease him more uh, in, in the second service when he comes. But isn't this something? You know that old song that Jesus, we used to sing in Sunday school, it says, Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world, red and yellow, black and white. Uh, they are connected. You know what? We're all red and yellow, black and white. There are so many different parts of us from different people groups around the world that make us who we are. And this new technology is, just, is helping us discover that. For instance, let's just take a moment to look at our skin tone. Our skin variations are easily explained when we see how the different genes of different people groups join together and live in different climates, okay? There are only two chromosomes that make up the pigment in your skin or what's called Called melanin. This melanin gene is this brown pigment that all of us have within our skin, and this really adapts to climate and diet. This is the way God has designed us. The skin, for instance, of those who settled on the coast would eat more rich seafood, vitamin D enriched seafood, and so it would change the color of their skin versus those who lived inland in hot or cold temperatures. Are you guys following me on this? Because I want you guys to understand this, all right? We are way more connected to each other than we may think, but sadly, in our past, we know that this difference in skin or in melanin have caused people to separate themselves from each other in what we call racism today. The Bible has been misused in the past to preach things like interracial marriage as sin. When we see and look at our DNA structure, we know that that's totally impossible because we have so many different ethnicities in our own DNA that interracial marriage, of course, it's not a sin. That's not the way it is supposed to be. In fact, it ought to be a beautiful kaleidoscope of God's creation, something to be celebrated, instead of something that is used to divide and destroy each other in racism. Here's what the Bible says about the origin of man. This is about your race. Here we go. Genesis chapter 2 tells us that we are all created by God. It also tells us in Scripture that we are all made in God's image. In Acts chapter 17, it says, we are all one race. In John 3, 6, and he said, we are loved by God, each and every one of us. Our beautiful and creative God designed us to be different colors, to express his beautiful and creative image. We are all descendants of Noah and his family. If we look and remember as we've been going through the book of Genesis, we know that after the flood, Noah's three sons and their three wives who had varied skin tones uh, came off the ark and that's what repopulated the world. It's easy for us to explain how we have so many different colored people today based on just the couple of genes that would adapt to whatever environment each brother would, would, would settle in, okay? And that's where it gives us the skin tones that we have today. This also explains why we have so many different connections with different people groups around the world within our DNA. We all come from one family who God spared from a worldwide flood and then dispersed around the world. Do you get that? So this is all found in Genesis 9, 10, and 11. After, in Genesis chapter 9, remember, Noah is off the ark. He and his family and his three kids, their wives, are told to repopulate the whole earth. That's uh, Genesis 9, 1. God says, be fruitful and multiply. It's the same words that he told Adam and Eve in the beginning. 
And then we look at Genesis in the next two chapters, chapters 10 and 11. This really talks, this covers the span of time where this family is out to do that. This chapter 10 and 11 cover about 150 years of history. And these two chapters are also very interesting because as you read them, you'll realize that they're not in chronological order, okay? What I mean by that is that they're not chapter 10, then chapter 11. Chapter 10 and 11 are the same story, but they're told into recall as a, as a recall to history. If you look at Genesis chapter 11, verse 1, and it goes all the way through verse 9, it describes this origin of languages and people groups. But careful readers of Genesis notice that in chapter 10, it really talks about how people and languages are already happening what seems to be before the Tower of Babel. Look at chapter uh, 10, verse 5. It says this, the coastland people spread in their lands, each to his own language, by their clans in their nations. All right? So look at that. And then when you get to chapter 11, verse 1, it says, Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. Okay, it looks like it almost seems like it's contradicting itself, but it is not indeed. The author Moses knew what he was doing. He was telling this as a history lesson. He first describes the spread of people and languages in chapter 10, and then he describes the origin of that diversity in chapter 11. Chapter 10 tells us about each people group and where they went. Chapter 11 tells us why they went and how they got there. Does that make sense? Okay, so both of them are meant to be read together as a account of history, all right? So if we look at chapter 10, chapter 10 for us is our Ancestry.com result page, all right? This is where you and I can find all of our roots of where we come from, all right? And so let's just do that really fast because it's really, really fun. Most, if anybody into finding their genealogies and finding out who they are, this is what you're going to do in chapter 10. All right, so let's start with Japheth. This is one of Noah's sons. Um, you'll see that in the first portion of chapter 10. Now, there's these people called ethnologists. Anybody heard that? It's a five-letter word, a five-dollar word, I mean, um, and a five-letter word, five-dollar word. Um, and ethnologists, these are people who study names for living, and they study names back through history to find out where these people are from, um, what they've done in their life. And ethnologists have been able to study the names of J. Path's genealogy throughout history, and they find their descendants and their people who made their way through the coastlands and into Europe and Asia. Okay, so if you have European descent or Asia descent, you're of the genealogy of Japheth. Isn't that interesting? One group settled in India, one group in Europe. Together they form what is known today as the Indo-European family of nations. Anybody ever heard that? That comes from Japheth. These people seem to be gifted in a general sense in the area of philosophical and intellectual pursuits. All right? It's interesting to know that both Indians and Europeans today, by tradition, trace their ancestral roots back to Japheth. The early Greeks say that their ancestor was a man named Japotos, which is a lot like Japheth, isn't it? Which is interesting, which is you and I today. Moses has very little to say about the genealogy of Japheth than the other, compared to the other two genealogies. But most people in America, if you're of the European descent, you are of the stock of Japheth. So now you know your great, 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 so on, so on, grandpa. That's you. It's interesting to spend time to know our family tree. The next genealogy that we see in chapter 10 is the genealogy of Ham, Moses' other son. And ethnologists have traced him mostly to Egypt, Africa, and the land of Canaan, okay? Uh, and we see that throughout history and throughout scripture as well. Um, these tend to be more of the darker-skinned people. The family of Ham seem to be particularly gifted in technical proficiency. This is what they did well throughout history. Um, the Hamites, as we're called, they're the pioneers of mankind. All great early civilizations were from the tribe 
tribe of Ham. We've got the Egyptians. We've got the Babylonians. We've got the Canaanites. We've got the Mayans. We've got the Aztecs. All of these people, if these are in your heritage, you are of the, the line of Ham, which is interesting. Ham had four sons, and these four sons were known today throughout the world. One's name was Cush, and there is a place in Egypt uh, called Cush today. And, uh, the, and of course, uh, we're talking about Arabia uh, and Ethiopia. Ethiopians still trace their ancestry back to Cush. The other two, um, the Lydia, Egypt, North Africa, and Palestine. Isn't that interesting that we can go all the way back to Noah's family and still know exactly where they, they laid roots in? The next one is the genealogy of Shem. This is the last. This becomes the Semitic group, okay? And generally speaking, these people settled in the Middle East. Uh, Shem and his ancestry are given the religious uh, priority uh, or propriety of mankind, okay? Now, what this means is that these people were responsible under God to develop the spiritual life of mankind. Of course, this is generally speaking. Abraham, as we will see, comes from the line of Shem. Abraham is the father of the Hebrew nation, which one day uh, is where Jesus comes out of. So if you have Hebrew uh, descendant, you are from the genealogy of Shem. Isn't that neat? So chapter 10 tells us who. Then we get to chapter 11. Chapter 11 drops this bomb on us and tells us that as we look at chapter 10 and we see, wow, these people seem to be doing exactly what they're supposed to be doing, we realize that that, that wasn't the case. It tells us how God actually had to get these people to move across the world. God told them to spread out over the whole earth, but they were not spreading. They were clustering. Even worse, they were choosing in their cluster to disobey God and to create this big city and this big tower in this land called Babel. All right, later this land would be called Babylon. Does that sound familiar? Or Babylonia. To ex they want to exalt themselves. They want to worship themselves. The results become humanity divided into nations and languages. This is the birthplace of nations. So here's where we go. Now, based on percentages of years, we're talking about 150 years of history. By the time we get to Babel, the population of the entire world from those three sons is about 30,000 people. All right, so think about that for a second. The population of the entire world is the size of Eustace and Mount Dora. I mean, that's it. The whole world, whole planet. And they were huddled together in this place in Babel, and the people of the earth decided to elect a leader. They decided to go away from making God their leader, and they decided to elect this great hunter, this guy named Nimrod. Uh, you guys have heard that before? Yeah, that's what I usually get is a chuckle when you hear Nimrod, because it's used almost like as a, a derogatory term today. But this was the first celebrity on the planet. He was well-known. He was beloved. He was a mighty hunter. He was also from the descendant of Ham. We see that in Genesis chapter 10. He tells us of Nimrod's kingdom found in the plains of Shinar, which is called Babel or Babylon, all right? So this is where chapter 11 picks up. Everyone following me so far? You're like, wow, this is a lot. Okay, well, let's read the first four verses of chapter 11 in Genesis. It says this, Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar. This is also called the plain of Babylon. And they settled there. And they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they made brick for stone and bitumen, or which is another word for tar, for mortar. Now, here's a clue here. If you remember our ancestry research in chapter 10, you remember that Nimrod was a Hamite. The Hamites were known for as being the technicians of humanity. So here's what we're talking about. This ingenious people learned how to make fire, or learned how to fire bricks so they can be stronger and they can build larger and they could use tar and they could create these large structures. Okay, so let's get to verse four. And it says this, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heaven. And let us make a name for ourselves lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. See, that's exactly what God said not to do, right? Nimrod 
was going to build a false religious system that would be a new approach to God. He was going to build a tower by his own works that would reach heaven, that would reach God the way he wanted to, and it was to be a substitute for the one true God. What we see in Babel is the first organized, idolatrous religious system in the history of the world. They're going to focus on worship through the building. Thank God we no longer focus on worshiping our buildings, right? We're about the church. Is that right? Well, sometimes we do, don't we? Yeah, we got to be careful for that. That's right. So Babylon didn't want God in the center of their system. They wanted idolatry. They wanted to set up a system opposed to God. In his sermon on this text, J.I. Packer calls this passage a mirror to the modern world. The builders of the Tower of Babel had two purposes in mind, both mentioned in verse 4. And you can write these down in your notes if you'd like to. Number one, their purpose was to make a name for themselves. And number two, so they may not be scattered over the face of the whole world. This was a direct slap in the face to God who told them, go out into all the world and fill the earth. The tower was meant to make a statement, don't mess with us, we're the greatest. We're the greatest. Now we love that word, don't we? we, do we li- who else likes to say we're the greatest? We love superlatives in our culture. We, we overuse them so much. You know what super- superlative is? When we just don't say it's good, we have to use some exalted word to make it really good. We don't just say it's good. We say, this is the best ever we've ever had in my life. I heard a person had a burrito this week. He said, that was the best ever. I said, really? That was the best ever? Your burrito? Uh, no, it wasn't. We can't just say things like, this is bad. We have to say, this was just the worst ever. Someone came, oh, this is just the worst. They say, what's wrong? They said, oh, the Wi-Fi's down. It's been down for 10 minutes. This is the worst ever. <laughs> really, this is the worst ever. We totally overuse superlatives. See what I did there? <laughs> it's got to be the biggest. It's got to be the bestest. It's got to be the fastest. It's got to be the smartest. It's got to be the tallest. It's got to be the richest. That's why we compete. That's why we keep score. That's why we love competition. That's why we love to win. There are two implications out of the Tower of Babel that I would like to pass along to you for you to think about in our culture today. First, I would suggest to you that the compulsive drive for power and prestige stems from our deep-seated fear of dependence on someone else. We want to be the best in our field, the biggest, the strongest, the smartest, the loudest, the richest, the fastest, because if we are the best, then we won't have to depend on anybody. In fact, others will have to depend on us. Isn't that the drive for the lottery? How many of you have thought, boy, if I could just win the lottery, that I wouldn't have to depend on my work. I could finally give people to depend on me. One poet wrote, I am the master of my fate, the captain of my soul. You know, the million dollar word for this is the word pride. The word pride. This is what drives a lot of our culture today. Do you know that pride is the original sin of the universe? Do you remember what Satan told Eve in the garden? He said, no, you're going to be like God. The problem with pride is it deceives us into thinking that we can be good enough without God. As long as we keep to being the best, we won't have to depend on someone like God. You know, I don't think we're too far away from Babel today. I believe that's what drives a lot of our culture to find the bigger and the better factor, the newest, the best, the most advanced technology I think it's so that some of us could say, when God says, no, you need me, I can say, no, I don't need you. Look at all the advancements. Look at all the wonderful things. Look at all of the technology. I don't need God as much as you may think I need God. That's why it's interesting when God says, boy, it's easier for the camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. It's because we depend on ourselves. We have no time for God. We can say, look at what my hands can do. The Bible says, drop the pride. 
It's deceiving you. It will not lift you up to heaven like you may think. It will break you down. The Bible, in fact, says, humble yourself before the Lord, and he will lift you up. That leads to the second implication, which is also the compulsive drive for power and security. This compulsive drive for power and security leads us to moral degeneration of our soul. This is also called arrogance. Pride and arrogance. Our desperate search for significance leads us to compromise our values time and time again in the name of independence, in the name of freedom, in the name of wealth, and in the need to control our own destinies. So what we often do is we cut corners. We use illegal drugs to get a step ahead. We break the rules. We lie to people. We lie to our parents. We lie to our spouses. We lie to our friends. We even lie to ourselves. We use people and then we discard them when they don't fit our plans anymore. And what seems like an innocent pursuit of the best turns out to be sinister in the end. Just consider Babel. Was it wrong for them to want to build the tower? In and of itself, no, it is not. There is nothing wrong with creating a great city. There's nothing wrong with working as a team to accomplish a great goal, except when it is fueled with pride and arrogance. The end is this grotesque and outright act of evil. The tower becomes a symbol of man's independence away from God. Like I said, I don't think we're that far away from Babel today. And the reality is, is life is hard without God. You end up constantly becoming desperate for the best and the biggest. You start doing desperate things like building towers that reach into heaven. Arrogance makes men think they're invincible. But no one is invincible. Remember those haunting words from Isaiah chapter 40 that says, All men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. It's at this point that we see Babel becoming a statement of of pride and arrogance. But it's here where grace comes in. The story doesn't end there. God doesn't leave them to perish in their pride and their arrogance. He comes in and saves them from themselves. And do you know that's really what God does for us? God saves us from ourselves. Let's read God's solution to man's pride. It starts in verse 5. It says, then the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, behold, they are one people, and they have all one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing they propose to do will be impossible for them. (laughs) I've got to stop with verse 5. I think it's funny. I think it's almost got a mocking tone as I read it to me. Man is building this tower so they can be big, so they can reach heaven. And this tower is so far from being in heaven that when God sees it, he has to go down there, which I think is, I think is ironic. Then I look at verse 6 and it says this, Behold, they are one people, they have one language. I want you to notice that this signals that God is not only about to divide their language, but he's going to divide all these, this one people into many peoples or nations. This is where we're going to get our nations. This also tells us that God has begun a global plan for nation and tongue. Okay, do you get that? Let's get to verse 7. It says, Come, let us go down and confuse their language. Who is the let us? This is the triune God at work. This is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit working together. Let us go down there. Let us confuse their language so they may not understand one another's speech. And so the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore, its name is called Babel, because the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there, the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. You read all that? Okay, good. That's excellent. It's all Greek to me, right? That's what this is. Okay, this, imagine that moment when all of a sudden nothing made sense to each other. They had dispersed. They had to disperse. This is now why we have nations and languages. What's most interesting is the confusion of tongues today is most evident. Linguists know that most of the languages of the earth 
are gathered into three main groups. Isn't that interesting? 6,500 different languages can be divided into three groups. Where did that come from? Interesting. So I want, I want you guys to think about this for me, with me. His response to our pride and arrogance was to make it harder for man to communicate. And what he actually did is he used their own pride against them by dividing them into nations. So this is what would happen. The pride of one group of people will restrain the pride of the other group of people. Think about that. Do you guys know there is an actual reason why we have the government today? There is a purpose. Imagine if Russia was the one government for everybody. There'd be no check and balance. There'd be no accountability. There'd be no one to challenge some of their rules. What if America was the one ruler overall? There'd be no one to check and balance. And so you have these different countries with these different languages, and each one of them, we see it as turmoil and trouble, but there is one actually keeping the others in check and constantly going, this is not how the world would be, and it's actually God using man's pride against us to keep us from going anti-Christian. Isn't that interesting? Never saw it like that before. Here's some takeaways from all this, okay? I want to just leave you with five takeaways. Number one, when God says go, don't huddle. <laughs> go, all right? He's got a global plan for mankind. You play a part in it. When we get to the New Testament and we see Jesus about to ascend into heaven. What does he say to his disciples? In Matthew 28, 19, I'll give you a hint. Go, go, make disciples of what? Whoa, where'd that come from? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Do you think we're doing too much holy huddling here what do you think is going to happen when we stick in our tower and we don't go out into the world like God has asked us to? We have got to go and make disciples. Number two, don't be deceived by pride and arrogance. There is a big temptation out there to say, I can do it my way. I can do it on my own. The reality is, people, I don't care if you've been a Christian for 50 years and you have 10 doctorates, you need the Lord. We all need the Lord. We are not as strong as we think. No matter how elaborate our plans are, no matter how big our tower is, no matter the superlative that we use, no matter how sophisticated the technology in our culture becomes, God is above all. And God looks at all of our technology and he goes, boy, I better go down there to see what's going on. Number three, the gospel of Christ flourishes in language. I want you to get this. God's division of the world into different languages hinders the rise of a global, monolithic, anti-Christian state that would have the power to simply wipe out Christians, wipe out the cause of Christ, wipe out the message of God. The Bible tells us that in the last days, there will be a great global government. We see a glimpse of that in Revelation chapter 13. Do you know what they call this great one monolithic government? They call it the great city of Babylon. It's connected to Babel. But Christ will reign supreme. Here's an interesting thought. Think about this. God is more concerned about the dangers of human uniformity than human diversity. Okay? The wickedness of man is far too evil to be allowed to unite in one language or one government. Therefore, brothers and sisters, celebrate diversity. Celebrate diversity. 
Enjoy the beauty of different colored people in different languages, in different nations. Discover how God is being displayed in India and in Africa and in other places around the world. Get outside of your box. Number four, the authority and power of Jesus is magnified. Jesus lays claim on every language group and every people. Remember Matthew 28, what does he say? He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go out to every nation. Isn't that interesting? In response to sin, God has divided the languages and nations. But in the end, it actually magnifies the authority and the power of Christ to make disciples in every language. I believe that his power is all the more glorious because it breaks into so many different languages and people when it comes to salvation. And it reminds me of that great precious truth in Philippians where it says, one day every knee will bow in heaven and in earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. God's authority is magnified. If you haven't, Listen to how other cultures sing about Jesus and their language. Listen to how this beautiful display of God's power. There's a great video online of how great thou art. Do we know the tune? And listen to as these different nations sing that song in their language. It's just glorious to hear God magnified that way. And finally, Jesus is praised. Number five, the praise that Jesus receives from all languages is more beautiful than it would be if there were only one language and one people to sing. We now have a praise that is diverse and complex and expansive across the globe, all declaring Jesus as Lord, not only now, but in heaven as well. Let me show you Revelation chapter 5. I'll read this to you as I close. They sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain. And by your blood, you ransom people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom of priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Let me read you another one. I just love this out of Revelation chapter 7. This will be on the screen for you. It says this, After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. I like the sound of that. The story ends with the most glorious praise from every language of the earth. Praise the Lord. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Let's pray together. Thank you, God, for this time in your word and for these challenging chapters. And God, um, Lord, it is, it is incredible to see how we can have real life example, real life understanding of the different cultural norms and the different colored skin and the different traditions and things that we see all around the world, we can understand that from your word and we can see where that all came from. And it's pretty incredible. And I love to be able to apply this truth to our lives, to understand that there is a reason for the government that's set up. There is an, a reason why we have different colored people and that this reason is not to divide, but it's to show the diversity and the beauty of your image. God, is so cool to see through this scripture, Lord, how eventually your name is praised in 6,500 different languages and peoples. And it's just incredible to me. And Lord, we exalt you today. And Lord, as we look at this chapter, as we look at these and we see the close of these, this first section of Genesis, God, may we apply this truth to our life. Lord, we'll be able to step out of our comfort zones and to go where you send us to make disciples of all nations. Uh, that you would help us, Lord, to look at the diversity of this world and celebrate it and enjoy it instead of be frustrated by it. 
And God, I pray, Lord, that we would remember that we're not the top, that we're not uh, the people that can do it ourselves, but that we so desperately need you. So God, I pray that you would be the head of our life, that you would be the supreme Lord, and that we would lift our hands and cry out to you in praise and magnify you and, and, and let you know as every knee bows, every tongue confesses that you are Lord. God, thank you for this time. May uh, you put a blessing on these people today. In Jesus' name, amen.